Verse 6 of Judges chapter 17 says, In those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did what was right in his own eyes. The same verse is repeated again in in chapter 21, verse 25. In those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did what was right in his own eyes. And this is sort of seen as a theme of the book of Judges. And if you just read these two verses, or this one verse repeated a second time by itself, it's easy to ask the question, well, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Every man did what was right in his own eyes, so everybody's trying to do right. Maybe that's good. Or everybody did what he thought was right, maybe that's bad. Well, let's be clear, it's bad. And you read the book of Judges, and you see sin after sin, betrayal of God after betrayal of God, repeated, getting worse and worse and worse through the book. And you realize that when you come toward the end of the book in chapter 17 and in chapter 21, that this is actually a rebuke. This is actually a criticism, a judgment, a condemnation on Israel because everybody just did what was right in his own eyes. But I'm telling you right now that the reason we ask ourselves is this a good thing or a bad thing is because that's exactly how most people live today. And we're not even clear on whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. And because we want to think, yeah, I ought to be able to do what's right in my own eyes. Yeah, I'll do what I think is right. That's so good. That's how the world ought to be. Well, if you want to continue believing that, don't read your Bible. Because it will disabuse you of that idea. Because it's not true. And we see that very clearly here in Judges 17. I think about what's going on in our world today. I think about North Korea and Kim Jong-un threatening nuclear war. Seems right to him. Seems like it's the thing that he ought to do, and so that's what he's doing. Our president calls him names and belittles him. Seems right to him. Seems like what he ought to do. And we see the same thing repeated over and over, where people do what's right as that seems to Him, or as it seems to them. Let's look here in Judges chapter 17, and think about what happens before this. Now, the period of the book of Judges, just as a reminder of where we are in history, you have in Genesis the creation, the flood of Noah, You have Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob bringing you up through the end of Genesis. In Exodus, you have Moses. Moses leads the people out of Egyptian captivity, gets them to the edge of the promised land, and then he is taken away by God, and he dies. Joshua takes over. He takes over and conquers the promised land. And then you have a period of about 350 years between Joshua's death and the installation of Saul as the first king. And that 350 year period is the judges. It's before Saul becomes king, who's then followed by David, but after they conquer the land. So you've got 350 years where there is no king in Israel, and everybody is just doing what's right in their own eyes. And so you have here a man who lives in Ephraim. His name is Micah. He steals his mother's money. 1,100 pieces of silver. You see, when you're doing what's right in your own eyes, you can just make up morality for yourself. When everybody does what's right in his own eyes, there's a pretty good argument that people can make that theft is not wrong. What's the big deal? I wanted the money. I had a good use for the money. I took the money, 
It seemed right to me. This is actually the kind of ethics and the kind of morality that is holding the day in our culture right now. It's oftentimes called secular humanism. It's the natural outflow of evolution, the idea that there is no God, that we were all the result of of natural processes, random uh, accidents that created human life, created intelligence in all forms of life. And so there is no foundation of morality. There's no solid base on which morality always stands and never changes. That's the belief that is commonly taught in most of our secular educational systems. And in most of our culture, that's what people believe. I'll give you an example. The Humanist Manifesto, the second one, states, We affirm that moral values derive their source from human experience. Ethics is autonomous and situational, needing no theological or ideological sanction. Ethics stems from human need and interest. Now that's a fancy way of saying that ethics change from person to person and they come out of what a person needs and what a person is interested in or wants. So your needs and your wants determine right and wrong for you separately from every other person according to secular humanism. Everybody can just do what's right in their own eyes. There is no foundation of a creator, a divine creator, who sets absolute universal standards of behavior. That's the belief. It's the belief from the period of the judges to an extent, and it's absolutely the prevailing belief of the 21st century where we live. But you go back here to Judges 17, and not only do you see the immorality of a man who steals... 1,100 pieces of silver from his mother. If you go forward in chapter 17, he finds a Levite, a man of the priestly tribe of Israel, who's just traveling and looking for a place to set up shop, and he hires him to be his priest. Then in chapter 18, another tribe of Israel, the tribe of Dan, sends 600, sends some spies through. They come and they see the priest and the, the shrine that this Micah has set up in Ephraim. They go back and they tell their tribe, they come back with 600 men and they come into his house and they steal his idols. They steal his ephod. They steal this molten and graven image that he's made. And they take off with his priest and all his, all his idols. And Micah gets his own countrymen and they start chasing him and they catch up with him. And he says, and they tell him, you hush so you don't get killed. That's chapter 18, uh, verse 25. They threaten to kill him when he complains. And he looks and he says, they've got more men than we do. I'm going to have to hush. You see, that's what happens when everyone does right in his own eyes. When everybody just does what seems good for him and what seems good for us and what seems good for my tribe, theft, murder, threats of violence. Of course, the Danites go and they conquer a new city, Laish, and they set up those idols in their new city. And those idols stay there until it's destroyed. And it says that this priest that he hired from the Levite tribe, this Jonathan, Jonathan's descendants continue to serve as false priests in the tribe of Dan until the captivity of the land. It goes for about 500 years, four to 500 years, this falsehood that he sets up. But there's no right, there's no wrong. Can you see the same thing today? People say things like, I just don't see anything wrong with it. 
I'm going to repeat this a few times and then we're going to come back, Lord willing, in a few minutes and we're going to address this attitude. But you ask yourself, have you ever said it? I've said it. Have you ever thought it? I've thought it. I just don't see anything wrong with it. People say, I just don't see why God would care who I love. Or I just don't see why God would care how I spend my time. I just don't see why God would care if we wait for marriage if we're really in love. You see, you're talking about how you see it. You're talking about what's right in your own eyes. It's a gigantic mistake. Second thing you see here in Judges 17, when people just do what's right in their own eyes, you see people making up religion for themselves. So Micah has stolen his mother's money. His mother has uttered a curse against whomever stole her money. Micah comes and he repents. He says, you know what, Mom? Uh, I'm the one who stole your money. And she says, oh, thank goodness. You know what? Let's turn this into religious symbols. She says, I'm going to dedicate this whole 1,100 pieces of silver and we're going to make a molten image and a graven image to the Lord. Now, a molten image means that they take some of the money, they take some of these coins, and they take them to a silversmith, presumably, and he melts them down. He melts them into a liquid silver, and he pours them into a form, some sort of image, and they take the image of this, uh, of this form that the silver's poured into, it's hardened, and it comes out, and it's some sort of statue. A graven image is similar, but the graven image, instead of being formed, is carved. So whether or not this is made of silver, probably not. Probably they take some of the silver and they buy a sculpture out of wood or some sort of stone. And so they bring a molten image of silver and some sort of carved image of wood or stone they make an ephod, which is a really fancy vest or robe, and maybe sometimes with a necklace around it. And he installs one of his own sons as priest. Now why does Micah and his mother feel free to do this? Because everyone does what's right in his own eyes. But I want to point something out to you in verse 3. His mother, talking about giving these 1,100 pieces of silver, says, dedicated to the Lord. The word translated Lord in the original Hebrew is Yahweh. It's the name for Yahweh, His covenant name. In Hebrew, where they, in the Old Testament, they didn't have uh, vowels. They only had consonants. So it's Y-H-W-H. Here's the point of that. They weren't making up a new religion. They weren't creating a new religion. They weren't making a, an idol to Baal or a, an idol to Asheroth or an idol to uh, the god Ra from Egypt or anything like that. They were making these idols, but they were dedicating them to Yahweh, to the covenant God of Israel. So they're trying to worship Yahweh but look at how they're doing it. They're saying it, we're going to do it our way. We're going to do the way we want it. Yahweh has said, you come to the tabernacle to worship. You don't make any graven images. You don't bow down to any carved stone idols. You come here and you worship at my altar and you sacrifice the animals and the things that I have told you to sacrifice. And only descendants of Aaron will be priests, and only Levites will serve in the temple. That's what Yahweh has said. And they said, yeah, we're going to take an Ephraimite and make him our priest, which is Micah's son before Jonathan gets there. 
And we're going to carve our own images and form our own molten images and we're going to have a shrine right here in our own house and we're just going to do religion on our own terms. And brothers and sisters, this exact thing is still happening today. Still happening right now. All across the country and all across the world. Colossians chapter 2, verse 20. Paul says, If you have died with Christ to the elementary principles of the world, why, as if you were living in the world, do you submit yourself to decrees such as do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, which all refer to things destined to perish with use, in accordance with the commandments and teachings of men? These are matters which have, to be sure, the appearance of wisdom in self-made religion and self-abasement and severe treatment of the body, but are of no value against fleshly indulgence. Let's be clear here. God always condemns self-made religion. God's religion is always based on what God says. And He says, you don't make a bunch of extra rules to go on top of my religion, and you don't change around the rules that I've made to do it in a different way. If you want to worship me, you worship me as the Creator and as the Sovereign Authority. And to change what I've said and to do it your own way is to disrespect my role as creator and sovereign authority. And that's not worship. That's will worship. That's self-made religion. It's not the religion of God. It's the religion of worshiping yourself. But people say things. I just don't see why God would care. I just don't see why God cares how we worship. I just don't see why God cares what name is on the building. I just don't care why God I just don't see why God cares what day of the week we worship. It's not about what you see. It's not about what you see. It's about what God sees. Everybody did what was right in his own eyes and it was wrong in God's eyes. That's the whole point. You can't do it what seems right to you. What you can't see is wrong. What you need to see is what God said. And look at it how He looks at it. That's His point. That's why it's wrong that every man did what was right in his own eyes. You see, what can seem right to a person can be absolutely wrong to God. Think of Saul of Tarsus who we most frequently call the Apostle Paul. Saul of Tarsus was a Pharisee, a man dedicated to God, a devout Jew, absolutely committed to doing what he thought was right for God and for the Jewish religion. And he was absolutely wrong. And he became a persecutor and a murderer as a result of it as a result of persecuting Christians and even putting Stephen to death and maybe others that we don't know about. Now he was redeemed. He was transformed. He was turned into the Apostle Paul. The chief of sinners became an apostle. The apostle to the Gentiles. This Jewish steeped in the old law Pharisee became the apostle to the Gentiles. But for a long time, he was doing what he thought was right but was actually wrong. He didn't see anything wrong with it. It seemed right in his own eyes. But it was wrong. 1 Kings chapter 15, verse 4 says, But for David's sake the Lord his God gave him a lamp in Jerusalem to raise up his son after him and to establish Jerusalem. Why? Because David did what was right in the sight of the Lord. In God's eyes. David did what was right in the sight of the Lord. And when you come to the period of the kings in the southern kingdom, 
Jerusalem, Judea, Benjamin, you see this thing repeated in many, many of the kings. This same idea of doing what's right. And in the northern kingdom, you say he did, they say over and over again, he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. An example, 1 Kings 15, 11, Asa did what was right in the sight of the Lord as his father David had done. It says the same thing about Amaziah, Azariah, Jehoash, Uzziah, Jotham, Hezekiah, and Josiah. Can the same thing be said about you? Do you do what's right in the sight of the Lord? Or do you do what's right in your own eyes? There's a big difference. There's a big difference. And we have to come to terms with the fact that our hearts are just not good guides. What we feel, what feels right to us, can be terribly misinformed, can be terribly misleading. And I see people make this make mistakes in a lot of different directions on this. I see some people condemn ideas, condemn programs and approaches, and their basis is this doesn't feel right because it's not the way we've always done it. Well, what feels right the way we've always done it? It's just not telling us what's right and wrong. By the same token, people say, well, I just felt so good when we were doing it. I just know God wants us to do this. It just felt right. It's not a good, it's not a good guide. Jeremiah 17 verse 9 says, The heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? Your heart is not a trustworthy guide. How it feels is not how you make these decisions. The way you make these decisions is to check God's Word. Because the answer is not inside you, it's outside you. God will put it inside you as you take His Word into your mind and into your heart. I'll give you three quick, quick verses from Proverbs. Proverbs 14, 12. There is a way which seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Proverbs 16, 2. All the ways of a man are clean in his own sight, but the Lord weighs the motives. Proverbs 30, verse 12. There is a kind who is pure in his own eyes, yet is not washed from his filthiness. You can feel good about it. You can feel right to you. It can feel like what God wants you to do. It'd be absolutely wrong. You can think you're clean and you're washed by the blood of Christ and still be filthy. How do you know the difference? You look in God's Word. Because righteousness only comes from God. It doesn't come from us. It comes from Him. Romans 10 verse 3, Not knowing about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. You see, when you do what's right in your own eyes, you're saying, I'm righteous. You're saying, what I see, and what I think, and what I feel, that's the standard of right and wrong. And so that leads you to not look for and to not consider what God has said and how He's told you He looks at it and to ignore the actual standard of right and wrong. And so not knowing about God's righteousness, you develop a righteousness of your own, which is actually wickedness. And so you do things like theft and assault and murder and false worship and false gods and creating your own religion. And it seems right. And it feels good. But it's just as wrong as it could be. Let's not do what's right in our own eyes, but let's always ask the question, how does God see it? What has God said about it? Because it's the only trustworthy guide to eternity. Where are you on your journey to eternity? Are you headed in the right direction? Are you headed in God's direction? Are you headed in the wrong direction? 
Are you charting your own course, hoping you'll figure it out as you go along? You won't. You can only get there with a guide. You can only get there with the assistance of the eternal King. If you are not yet united with Christ, if you are not yet a part of His body, added to His kingdom, it's time to change course. To come to Christ for the first time, you have to hear His Word, believe in Him, confess that faith, repent of your sins, be immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins, united with Him in the likeness of His death, buried with Him in baptism. If you're ready to be buried with Christ in baptism, if you need to return to Christ and make right what you've done wrong, please come down front as we stand and sing.